Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the show. Well, every week on the show, we like to ask our viewers to send in their questions about uh, the topic that we're talking about via Facebook, Twitter, and email. And of course, today, the show is all about bankruptcy. So we're going to get straight to your questions for our guest, attorney Claude Lightfoot. The first question, our viewer question is, is there a minimum amount of debt that I have to have in order to file for bankruptcy? No, there isn't. And what may be a, a minimum debt to one person may be a huge threat to another person. It could be just one particular creditor in a position to garnish someone's wages and the entire family collapses. So there is not a de minimis standard. Okay, and so on that note, we were talking right before that break about people filing uh, for bankruptcy more than once. And we were kind of going over uh, the amount of time that you have to file. Explain that if you can, because it was starting to get a little bit tricky there. Well, when a person files a Chapter 7 and the case is concluded, and they find the need to file a Chapter 13 again, mm -hmm. they could actually do so right away if they needed it. However, they wouldn't get a discharge in the Chapter 13. It's only after four years from that earlier Chapter 7 can they file a 13 in which they get a discharge. Four years after it's been completed filed. by, or four years after it's been from filed. From filing to filing. And, and that brings up the question about, well, many Many people have a misconception and in Chapter 13 they have to pay all of their debts in full. Mm -hmm. That is not so. They have to certainly pay the delinquency on the property that they're trying to keep, whether they're behind on their house notes or behind on their car note. That has to be paid back in full. Any taxes that are recent income taxes have to be paid back in full without interest, I might add, which is a big improvement over the IRS arrangements that typically could be had. Mm -hmm. But the unsecured creditors, that's the people without any mortgage, the credit cards, the finance companies, the, uh, cr the department stores, the medical bills, those can be paid back based on a best efforts approach. If they can only get paid 10% on those debts, because that's all the debtor's abilities are, mm -hmm. then at the conclusion of all the payments under the plan, whether it be three years or five years, the debtor gets a discharge from the portion not paid. Mm -hmm. So a discharge is available in Chapter 13. It's just that certain debts have to be paid in full. Um, on the subject of what the debtor has to pay, um, you and other attorneys who do bankruptcy uh, law and represent people who have to seek bankruptcy or get a consultation, could you Tell us what generally in your field, if somebody wants to consult with someone like you, uh, and then if after consulting they decide they want to go forward, what are the approximate costs for Chapter 7 and Chapter uh, 13 consultations and then for filings? Well, I've n I have never charged for a consultation. I okay. spend an hour with people all day long to figure out what they need to do and to advise them on what they might consider. And I I've just not. Uh, been one to charge for that and I think most of the community in the consumer right. area so is people like can that. talk to lawyers who are pract practicing in this field and get some real help figuring out whether or not it's in their best interest or not and then if you're going to be able to help them or, or you agree that it's good to go forward with bankruptcy can you give us some ballpark let's just say for smaller families? once we go uh, on, on routine cases the court of uh, fixes the fee at twenty five hundred dollars for the entire length of the case and it might be five years for a chapter 13. most attorneys get a small amount up front and the balance is paid through the repayment plan so the attorney as the debtor pays his payments on his plan that the debtor's attorney can be paid on the Chapter 7 cases, it's a payment before the case is filed. They're generally cheaper. People might charge, depending on the simplicity of the case, up to $2,000. Unusual that it would be more than that. And that includes the filing fee, which is substantial, $306 okay. for Chapter 7. Good. Thank you. Is there an average length of time that it takes to complete these cases? It's pretty simple in terms of the logistics. Collecting the information and careful conversation with the debtor is the most important part mm -hmm. and then once the paper is the paperwork is prepared it's filed electronically so that's very quick and easy a hearing with the trustee who's appointed happens within a month and then there's a 60-day period after that for creditors to file 
complaints for their rights in the event of there's a belief that there's fraud in connection with a debt, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. When that period expires, the discharge is granted and the debtor receives that discharge in the mail like all the creditors do as well. And you were going to answer this other question. How f uh, often do you find that people do have to file bankruptcy more than once? It's not that often. With the hurricane uh, experiences that we've had, people that might have had to use a bankruptcy prior to the hurricane may have been devastated and you might have repeat cases but for the most part as long as people's employment and health holds up they work their way out of their problems. Okay. Right. We have another question here and you touched on this just a little bit and uh, this question comes to us from a viewer who wants to know the difference between secured and unsecured debt. A secured creditor is, is a debt that you owe and they, that creditor has collateral. They have the right to collateral. It could be called a security interest in the case of a car loan, and the car is put up as the collateral to secure that you pay that debt on time. Mm -hmm. And then in, in a, a home or a piece of real estate, it's going to be called a mortgage. So you can think of it, generally speaking, as a mortgage on property that's been put up as collateral for a loan. Mm -hmm. An unsecured creditor is somebody who does not have that. So it could be an unsecured priority creditor, which would be a tax. For a recent tax year, they have a priority status, but they're still unsecured. Or it could be an unsecured general creditor, somebody like Home Depot or the credit, hospital, credit card, or credit card, right. or any type of open account debt. And just to follow up on that, a secured creditor is in pretty good shape if they can't get paid on time. Ultimately, they could take the security, that collateral, that car, that house, seize it and sell it, and pay themselves out of that. That's correct, and it's important to note and that the, the bankruptcy, the line. they are in, with respect to that collateral, and it's important to note that the discharge, the thing that the debtor wants out of the bankruptcy, does not invalidate the mortgages. It invalidates the personal responsibility to pay the debt, but the mortgages are unaffected by the bankruptcy discharge. Okay, all mm -hmm. right. Here's another question. While filing bankruptcy, or will filing uh, bankruptcy mean that I won't be able to rent an apartment in the future? Well, we have some really excellent protections in the bankruptcy code in the field of employment and student loan grants and student loan borrowing. In those areas, whether it be private or public employment, government employment, the employers cannot discriminate against someone's employment simply because of a bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. And the same thing too for those who are applying for student loan grants or student loans. Mm -hmm. No discrimination due to a bankruptcy. And by the way, student loans are non-dischargeable in bankruptcy. You cannot get rid of those whatsoever. However. And, and we want to make it perfectly clear though, this is on your credit record. So the apartment complex, your employer, if they pull your credit, they're going to see it. It is. And and with it depends on the sophistication of the of the rent of the lessor. The, mm -hmm. rent, the one renting the property. Mm -hmm. If credit checks are a part of their normal process, they will discover a bankruptcy. And it, it, there's no mandatory application of how that information is used. Uh, to me, a smart creditor will see that someone who's well employed and has reasonable expenses but has a bankruptcy is a better candidate for the, for the apartment rental because they don't have the competition of other debts anymore. Mm -hmm. But the various uh, lessors will make such use of it as they as they see fit, but it will come out, and it's not an employment or a student loan protected area. So there could be a consequence there. And once a person files bankruptcy, if they're being if they are being hassled by creditors now, once they file for bankruptcy, does that just all cease? Does it stop immediately, or should it? It should, and it normally does. With within days, that notice of the bankruptcy is sent to all of the creditors, and as, as much as the phone used to ring, that's how quickly it should go silent. It should stop. Okay. Here's another question. I co-signed on a loan with my cousin who has since declared bankruptcy. Is that debt absolved or do I have to pay for it? Unfortunately, even though the cousin is now off the hook due to the bankruptcy discharge mm -hmm. and no longer owes that personal liability to pay that debt, the car, which was most likely the collateral, is still good for the debt. In other words, a foreclosure could still happen or a seizure of the car, but the co-signing cousin, unfortunately, is still liable on the debt. In a, in a Chapter 7 case, just because 
one person may file who's obligated to pay a debt doesn't mean that any co-signers also get off. Yeah, well, anybody who is going to co-sign really needs to be very, be very uh, sure about co-signing for that loan because you are saying I will cover that loan. Yeah, you were so, nobody else so right about that. <laughs> we recently on other shows had somebody talking about divorce law and if uh, you separate from your spouse and you don't get officially divorced the other spouse can sign on a debt and under Louisiana law and I think the same in other states you can actually uh, make your spouse be accountable for the debts that you co-sign for. Is, is that the You're same right. in bankruptcy? It is the same. Anybody who has co-signed, and that's the same in bankruptcy with these community debts. The community has liability. That is the marital community. That means husband Correct. and wife community. The community of, uh, in the marriage. Yeah, so if only one spouse is having difficulty, it will affect both spouses. Generally speaking, that's so. Uh, occasionally, I will have cases where there's a recent marriage and the debt precedes the marriage for one of the parties and it may not be necessary to have both of them file the bankruptcy case but in terms of eligibility that is are you qualified to file bankruptcy in the first place mm -hmm. the incomes of both spouses apply mm -hmm. so eligibility is an area we haven't talked about and we only have maybe thirty seconds so mm -hmm. uh, do you suffice say it something? to say that within the six months before the bankruptcy income information is collected and if a person's household has too much income they may not be eligible for chapter seven may not be eligible may not be eligible to file and have to consider chapter thirteen okay all right here's we do have time for one last question it says what happens to the funds in my ira if i declare bankruptcy do i get to keep them fortunately there's an exemption for iras and except for the contributions made to them within the 12 months before filing, the IRA itself is exempt. The IRA account is exempt or protected from the trustee. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, we That's are out of time. Thank you so very much for being on the show today. We have learned a lot about the world of bankruptcy. <laughs> Thanks <laughs> very much. Good and job. thank you all so much for joining us. Be sure to tune in next week when we will delve into another hot legal topic and go over some of the important things that you need to know to protect your rights. Claude, thanks so much for being with us, and thanks to everybody for watching at home and online. We encourage you to check out the website, johnredmondpoa.com or jrpoa.com, where you can watch every episode of the show and get more information about everything discussed here. So remember to send in your questions on Twitter, Facebook, and by email, and we will see you next time on John Redmond, Power of Attorney.